Good morning, everyone. Good to see you on this first Sunday of our new year. Made it through 2022. Now uh, let's just see what kind of dangers are ahead of us in 2023. But as we are continuing through our study together, we're in Matthew 21, almost at 24, because four is there on the screen. And when we concluded last time, we were discussing about the triumphant entry, how it is that Jesus is now preparing himself for the cross that is just a few days ahead of him, and that in his coming into this king or into Jerusalem, and we have the people shouting, the king, thy king is coming, Hosanna, son of David, so on and so forth, and how that this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies that we're going to look at in just a moment. And we are emphasizing how it is, in fact, that it is said from the Old Testament, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And how it is that as he is coming in as king, we also made connection to the fact in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, that those that are Christians, those that have been washed from our sins in his own blood, we also are being made kings and priests unto God and, and his Father. And that simply because we are being adopted into the family of God. So if Christ is in fact our brother and he is royalty, then what is it that we are being adopted into? We are being adopted into that royal family. So it would be similar to Moses in the Old Testament being brought into Pharaoh's house. And we are making the point that as he reigns, that we too are designed to reign inside of this kingdom, and therefore, how is it that we're supposed to, to reign? Well, he is coming in with meekness. We already discussed, meekness does not mean weakness. That in fact, we maintain the peace through our strength. Weakness only invites more aggression. So when we're considering those elements coming into play. And then we take into consideration how it is that Christ is entering. He did not make himself of any reputation. Now he had authority. And he has, or he has authority, and he has power. But power, true power and true authority does not have to flaunt itself. That in fact you can come in this type of setting in this type of mode and people will still recognize the authority and power that you have. So we're raising the question about can you believe a king would enter a city like this? And part of the reason why we struggle with this is because it's hard for us to think as the scriptures say that we should. And that's because of caring how the world thinks. Too much of what we are supposed to do inside of Christianity is stopped because we are too concerned about what people will think. And we've got to change that. I don't care what people think if what I'm doing is in accordance with the will of God. I don't need to change. Their thinking needs to change. And that is what is going on in this process. Jesus is changing the world's mindset about what it means to be a king. Jesus is changing the mindset of his apostles about what it means to sit on thrones. What does it mean to sit on a throne? To serve, to serve others. You have jo a job to do, work that's needing to be done. All right, so that brings us to where we're needing to move forward here. All right, so we already made mention of this that all this was done, that it might be fulfilled. What is needing to be fulfilled? Thy king cometh unto thee. So if this is what is being fulfilled, then what about a coming king in the future? Like our denominational friends want to believe. It's not there. This is fulfilled. It's done. It's over. 
premillennialism, an earthly kingdom with a thousand year reign, still yet in the future, is not true. Because Matthew looks at this, Jesus looks at this and he says, you're doing this so this can be fulfilled. It's done, it's moved out of the way. And it's just amazing how commentators and just how smart and full of wisdom they can be in other points, but then when it comes to this section, just because they have a preconceived idea, they start jumping through all kinds of hoops so as to explain away that this actually is not what it claims to be. It is what it claims to be. Verse 6, The disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do we make sure these connected? Okay, all right. Does anybody know what Hosanna means or what Hosanna is? What is it exactly that they're shouting? So nobody, like nobody came across this word and it's just like, you know what, that's not a word we use every day. Let me look that up. My commentary says save now. Okay. When we're doing our reading, when we're doing our studies, if you come across a word that you're not familiar with, don't just pass over it. Dig into it. See what's there. And if you have, so like with uh, Jamie's having a commentary there, I guess it's in the footnotes, is very helpful because what you have being presented here is a quotation of Psalm 118 and verse 25. And the psalm says directly, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. And this is what Hosanna means, and this is what the people are shouting as Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem. Save us. Save us from what? Well, just think about everything that's going on during this time frame. Think about the corruption, the mistreatment from the religious leaders. And here they are, and they are shouting, Save now, O Son of David. Deliver us from those that are persecuting us and those that are mistreating us. And at this time, it would not even be the Roman nation that's involved in that type of mistreatment. It is mistreatment from their own brethren. Those that are in charge and those that are looking down on them. Why? Because they're these little ones. They are the weak and beggarly. They are the ones that can be pushed around. And now here comes Jesus into Jerusalem and everybody is shouting His praises and saying, Save us. The Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers, priests, the high priest, they're not having anything to do with this. And in fact, in just a moment, we're going to find that they're going to have something negative to say about this entire process. But here are the despised ones. Here are the ones in need. And they see Jesus for what He is. He's a Savior. He's a Redeemer. He is one that has come to bring peace. And we're going to see in just a moment what it takes to have peace and prosperity with what he ends up doing next. But all of this ends up creating such a stir inside of the city. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. This phrase, and in particular this word, moved, is the same word that's used in Matthew 27, 51. 
when at the crucifixion of Christ, and it says that the earth quaked. When Jesus comes to town, this is the kind of ruckus. This is the kind of commotion that's caused and that's brought about. That the city is moving, that it is quaking because everybody has come out to see him. The whole city has come out. So it's similar to the events of his birth. What was the description of Herod and the Jews and all of Jerusalem when the wise men came asking for where the birth of the Messiah was? It's in Matthew 2, 3. All of Jerusalem was troubled at the news of his birth. Why? Why such alarm? All right, Herod is a bad man, and what about the Jews? They're, being, they're caught off guard. Should have been ready for this. What's the alarm? But it also is the realization of what it is that he's claiming to be. There is corruption inside of the system. And what was the promised Messiah designed to do? Clean up corruption. So they recognize that their days are numbered. And then you have the statement being made, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. If you remember, Galilee is a despised place. You go back, Matthew... Matthew 2, Matthew 3, it is referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles because it's so far north and so far away from the hub from Jerusalem that you have a lot of Gentile influence. And yet, this is the title that Jesus has tacked to him. He's not a prophet of Jerusalem. He's a prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee, because that's where he spent the majority of his time. Now, why would that be? As we've gone through all of our studies, and now we have this being mentioned of him, we need to remember, why did he do this? Why did he not spend as much time in Jerusalem as he did out in Nazareth, in Galilee, Capernaum? What was the reason? Okay. Which includes the Gentiles. All right, which includes the Gentiles. <coughs> but are there no lost people in Jerusalem? To the despised that would listen. Okay. The what did he say? Now, he mentioned about going to the despised and going to the rejected. But what he said at the end is really the key. People that will listen. And inside of Jerusalem, where the religious elite are, they're not going to listen. So Jesus left them. And he went out into the areas that people look down on. When the apostles are being called, and then they go to each other and they say, the prophet has come out of Nazareth. What is the response? That the other apostle gives in return about Jesus coming out of Nazareth. What is it? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That is the mentality about these places. That is the last place a self-respecting Jew would ever consider going to start a movement and to bring about converts. And that's where Jesus went.
and that because there's darkness. Light must go where darkness is. And to give these people a chance who are more than likely going to be the most receptive. So then in verse 12, we have it being said that Jesus enters in as king, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the colt of an ass. And then what is his first course of action upon his entry into Jerusalem? Jesus went into the temple of God, cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, as we mentioned, this is not the first cleansing. John 2, there was a first cleansing at the beginning of his work. Now we have another cleansing at the end of his work. And we really need to think about something here. John 2, 15. When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. When we are considering Christianity and what we may need to do for the purpose of keeping purity, violence is not off the table. Now, to a large degree, our brotherhood has done a very poor job and I honestly believe have manipulated our brethren into thinking that we are supposed to be pacifists. Christianity does not call for pacifists. If that were true, then you have Jesus going against his own mentality when you go over to Luke's account and you have him telling his apostles, sell your cloak and buy a sword. when we deal with the denominational world and how they want to focus in on, well, Jesus fed people. Jesus clothed people. Jesus dealt with their sicknesses. That's all true. But that is too much focus on one element of the work and neglecting the fact that he also taught people. And throughout our brotherhood, there's too much emphasis on the compassion, the mercy, the long sufferingness that this ends up being overlooked. As though this is not a real possibility for us. And you look at what Jesus is using when he had made a scourge of small cords. This is the same weapon that's about to be used on him before his crucifixion. And here he is using it on these people. This is an option. So as to protect people. Now, when we are considering this in its full scope of what's happening, these money changers and those that sold doves, these both are necessary things. They are needed to be here in this place because of what's happening is, as explained in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, there is a tax that is to be paid towards the temple. And the tax is to be paid by, uh, let me see here, with half a shekel. 
Well, a shekel is Jewish currency. They are under Roman occupancy. You can't use Roman money to pay this Hebrew tax. You have to exchange your Roman currency back into the Hebrew shekel. So what do you need? You need money changers. The problem was that these money changers are putting a charge, just like today, if you go into a foreign country and you have your money, our American money changed over into the euro or whatever, you get your money, but they're not gonna get, they're gonna charge you for that process. That's what's going on here, and they're not supposed to be doing that. And those that sold doves, they are supposed to be there too. You can even find it in the Old Testament where God says, if your travel is too far for you to make, and there's no guarantee that you can keep your sacrifice alive, sell it at home, bring that money with you, buy your sacrifice when you get to Jerusalem. So it's not a situation that, oh, well, these, per you know, these people shouldn't have been there. No, they needed to be there. It's the fact of what they're doing with their being there. That you have, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 20, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury interest, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. And then on top of that, who is it that they're abusing? The poor people. It is a poor person who has to offer a pigeon or a turtle dove. This is the poor man's sacrifice. They cannot afford a heifer. They cannot afford a lamb. So God says, okay, I'm not going to put a burden on you. Here's what you can offer instead. And these individuals are taking advantage of the poor people that are coming to worship God. Now, why would they do this? It's much like what we're seeing today, is it not? The corruption is just blatantly being aired in our faces. And the response is, well, what are you going to do about it? <clears throat> so just as Jamie said, the corruption's there. They are established in their place. And the money's trickling up. Herod's getting his piece. Roman government's getting their piece. Why change anything? So we're still in the midst of our conversation about covetousness. But then also when you take into consideration, as Jamie said, the poor people, what are they going to do? Well, if you really think about it, who would fall inside of the classification of a poor person or the poor community outnumbers the rich, does it not? The poor could very easily rise up. But when we're also considering the fact and you think about why they're doing this and where they're doing it, the why becomes more apparent. Why they're doing this is the same reason people commit sin today. Here's an artist's rendition of Herod's temple at the time of Christ. The Golden Gate, you have Court of the Women, Court of the Priests, which is this inner section here. You have the Altar, Court of Israel, Holy Place, the Tower where Paul is going to be taken uh, before he's taken before Felix, the Court of the Gentiles, and the Court of the Gentiles out here. Now, what part is the temple?
that's when you go to worship God. Okay. Technically, this is the temple. You have the holy place, most holy place. And when you go throughout, when you go into the Old Testament and you hear the dimensions and the description and the building of the temple, it's talking about the holy place, most holy place. So if this technically is the temple and that this is the holy place and that's holy ground, then what about the rest of this? All right, they're adding to it. But if this is the holy place, then how can you start thinking about this area? Not it's not holy. Therefore, what can you do there? The Gentiles can be there. Gentiles can be there. What kind of activities can you be involved in? You can sin. You can sin. This isn't the temple. This isn't holy. All of that's over here. At this event, though, where this is transpiring, more, more than likely, it's going to be happening somewhere out here in the court of the Gentiles. Or one of these other chambers. But Jesus calls even this outer section, he calls it as being the temple or a sacred place. Now, why is it un important to understand this aspect? Look at how they have all these compartments. And Jesus has been pointing out throughout our study how, how the Jews like to put religion into different compartments. They want to try to section things off from each other. You can be angry, just don't kill anybody. Oh, you can look, just don't actually commit adultery. And they're wanting to divide all of that up as though it's not connected. Now look at what's happening here. Here they are in the very shadow of where God dwells. And what are they doing? They're breaking his law, abusing their brethren, and abusing the poor. Why? Oh, because God is over here. God's not over here. Why do we commit the sins that we commit? Because God's over here. And he's not over here. And that's an idolatrous mindset. You go into the Old Testament, and the way that the Canaanite kings looked and viewed at the God of Israel, well, he's a God of the hills, but he's not a God of the valleys. Yeah, if we try to fight them in the mountains, that's where their God reigns. So let's go down into the valley and try to fight them, and we'll be victorious. And the Jews had a really bad habit throughout their history of compartmentalizing and pushing God off to where He is only effective and only working in certain areas and not in others. And so this event that we're going through right now ends up being commentary for what we're going to consider later in Matthew 23. Verses 16 through 21. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth there 
in. Here they are and they're wanting to play this game. Well, this technically is not the temple. So what it would be off limits over here is not necessarily off limits over here. So this finds its connection when we're dealing with our brethren and they want to say things like, well, Freed Hardeman is not the church. That type of reasoning and that type of argument is the very thing that we're talking about right here. Oh, well, the court of the Gentiles is not the temple. Yes, it is. Is God not here in the court of the Gentiles? Is He just simply stuck over here to where the rules and regulations of God's law have no effect over here? That's ridiculous. But that's what brethren do. That's what the Jews are doing. So this event of cleansing the temple is commentary for this. The Jews are changing money and expedient, but they're charging usury or interest on their brethren and they're breaking a command of God by their expedient. But can't you just hear the money changer saying, oh, but we're not in the temple. So it's okay. No, it's not okay. The things that God is commanding are not just regulated to the holy place, most holy place. These are things that are designed to follow you out of this place. If you cannot do it in the temple, then guess what? You can't do it at home. If you cannot do this at the temple, you can't do it at your job. You cannot do it at your farm. You cannot push these things to the side and say, well, they are designed to stay there. These things follow us everywhere. So they would say, well, we're not technically in the temple. No, but you are in the very shadow of it. And you think God is not in these courts? God is simply contained to this building here and He cannot see what's going on outside? He cannot hear what's happening? But that's the way we start viewing things. Is, well, Christianity, religion, morality, virtue, purity, all of those things are confined here to this setting on this day. And then when I go to my job, those things don't have to follow me there. Now, I know people think this way because I've had people argue that with me. Back in Virginia, there's a lady, she's a she was a Pentecostal preacher, and she worked for the television station, and she would produce commercials, and she would do voiceovers for commercials for stores that were adult-themed. And we called her out on it. You're a Christian. Why in the world would you be promoting these kinds of places? And she said, I have my Christianity over here and I have my job over here. Now, you don't think some of our brethren think that way? Christianity is just something I do on Sunday. But when I'm over here at work, I don't have to take that with me. Christianity is just something I do when I'm at camp. But it's not something I'm having to do while I'm at school. This is all over the place. Many people have the mindset Christianity and religion is contained to the building. And thus, is, that's why nobody wants to speak out beyond the walls. 
Why can you not engage somebody outside in the community in religious discussion? Because that's confined to here. And they're being taught not to. That's something you do here. Not something that goes out. And that's part of the reason why our own government has passed this bill that's protecting same-sex marriages. And if you read it, the way that it protects same-sex marriages is that you can talk about it here, but you cannot talk about it at your business. That's not protected. The only way that you can hold on to your beliefs and your convictions is if it is in this setting. But if you're a baker and you refuse to make a cake for a homosexual couple in their wedding, that's not protected because this is where religion is. And there's no reason for the religious world to get mad about that because they already think that way. They already think that way and act that way. So our government is just simply doing what the population's already involved in. And even for our own brotherhood, they view this in the same way and fashion. That we'll get in our events, we'll get in our buildings, and yeah, we'll talk about how bad Calvinism is. And we'll talk about how, yes, you need to have water baptism for the remission of sins. How that you're supposed to worship according to the scriptures. But we already know all that stuff. You're singing to the choir at that point. We're not the ones that are needing to hear that. There's people outside of here that are needing to hear that. Well, no, we can't go do that. And when you try to go against that type of system in that type of setting, as Jesus is doing, Jesus is going against the system. Some people are going to appreciate it, but those people that are benefiting from the system, they're going to hate you for it. So as we pointed out, this is also connected to our study of materialism and just how powerful it is. Would you imagine that after Jesus threw them out the first time and with a whip on top of that that three years later they would try to come back in and start the whole scheme over materialism is a subtle thing but it's not just materialism it's all sin And the devil knows just how powerful our individual sins are. And in Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted by this very thing of materialism. Turn stones into bread. That's a desire of the physical, of the material. The final temptation, bow down and worship me, and I'll make you ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. That's materialism. Here we have not shown to them, about them, how easy it was for it to creep back in. How easy is it for us? For our flaws, shortcomings, to creep back in. We must always be on guard. To what is trying to creep back in 
and be ready to drive it out. Now, so before we move on to verse 13, thoughts, questions? Okay. Verse 13, He said unto them, After driving them out, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This is a combination, quotation, of two different Old Testament passages. Isaiah 56, 7, Jeremiah 7, 11. Isaiah 56, 7 reads, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer. And notice this, for all people. So even in the Old Testament, you have a looking forward to that's not just going to be for the Jews. This is something that's designed, designed for everybody. Jeremiah 7, 11, Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And that right there, the fact that the Jews are reading the Old Testament every Sabbath day. There's no telling how many times they came across Jeremiah 7, 11, where Jeremiah says that God sees that his house that carries his name has been made a den of robbers. And just, oh yeah, that was true of Jeremiah's day. That's not going on today. See, we start compartmentalizing. That's talking about them. That's not talking about us. And they're right there in the very midst of what they're doing. And they don't acknowledge it. And even when you go back and you read the building of the temple and the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 7 through chapter 8, and how Solomon prays before the people at this event and inside of Solomon's prayer he prays to God or for God to listen to everyone that prays towards the house of the Lord. So you have it being said my house shall be called a house of prayer and even at the dedication of the temple Prayer is being made and it's being emphasized that this is a place that people are to come to pray. So it being a house of prayer conveys several thoughts. That when one is praying and that they would even come to the temple so as to pray, your prayer is a demonstration, number one, of your belief in God. And not just simply acknowledgement that God exists. Because belief, faith, is deeper than that. Belief, faith, is ultimately trust. So when one prays and when one is coming to the temple, you're acknowledging that you believe in God, but that you trust in God and what He has said. And that the temple was a symbol of man's need for God. The very fact that you would even travel three times out of the year to come to this place, to come before God, should emphasize how great a need that you have. And that the temple is set at the very heart of Judaism. When the children of Israel are brought out of Egypt and they build the tabernacle, the tabernacle is at the center. And all the other tribes, all the 12 tribes are organized around the tabernacle. That's done on purpose. Why would it be at the center? Because it's to be the center of your life. This is what you need. This is what's holding you together. 
And the temple has within it the very picture of redemption itself. What was it that was inside of the most holy place? The mercy seat. Very good. That's where God sat. His throne inside of the temple is called the mercy seat. And that's where you're coming. But if we don't appreciate that and we don't acknowledge that, what will we do with that? We'll manipulate it. And we'll pervert it. And we will no longer allow what the ceremony and what the ritual is designed to do for us. Why would I be coming to the mercy seat? I need mercy. I need mercy. But we know from Jesus giving the description of the Pharisee praying and the publican praying. What is the danger that comes with religion? Thinking you're better than you actually are. You can start using it to build yourself up when it's actually there to tear you down. And that's what Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers, uh, the priests and the high priests have done. Changed it from its original purpose to a place of commercial enterprise. We can gain from this. There's a stream of income that's untapped. And we're going to use it. They have changed it from a place of serving God to the serving of self. And as we studied in our sermon two weeks ago, Satan still operates this way. He knows that man needs religion. But Satan takes what God has made and he perverts it. to focus on the physical and not the spiritual. And so much of what's going on in Christianity is a focus on the physical. Our buildings have to look a certain way. We even had, we had one couple in Virginia. They would not assemble with us in Martinsville, but instead went across town to a congregation that we withdrew from because of spiritual problems that were going on over there because she did not like that the curtains and the carpet did not match. No joke. That's what she said. What is that? Look at the temple. Overlaid with gold. Silver all around. Look at these buildings, Jesus. How wonderful they are. It doesn't mean a thing. You look at polishing the pulpit, all the other events that we have going on throughout our brotherhood, and what are they focusing on? It's the physical. What's the physical draw to bring people? And then what's going on on the inside? Highway robbery. Doesn't mean a thing. And that we can actually be doing the most and the most beneficial thing that we can be doing inside of a VFW hall. And why would that be? Because we don't care what the world thinks. And the fact of prayer being a path to God's throne 
all of this encapsulated and showing one's dependence upon God and that Jesus is saying to them, this is what this place is supposed to be. And if that's what it is to us, then how will we treat others? We won't mistreat them. We won't abuse them. But let's not forget what it is taking to get to this place. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. So if we want to get, want to get it back to a house of prayer, what needs to happen? Pull out the leather. You draw out, you drive out the robbers. You have no place here. You're not going to claim sanctuary inside of these walls. You either change or you go. And we find the effect of that. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Here are the ones being mistreated by the religious elite. And now here they are and they're coming to Christ for help. What have they just seen? They have just seen an act of violence. Let's call it for what it is. This is a violent act that Jesus has just performed. And people are being drawn to him. Some might think, well, that's too aggressive. People will not come to that. Oh, yes, they will. The money changers, they don't like it. But so what? Why would I be concerned about protecting criminals? Well, let's pat the troublemakers. No. You get them out. But who does like that this is happening? The ones that are being abused. The little ones appreciate this because Jesus is standing up for them. Because the Pharisees were not helping them. They were trying to keep them out of the temple. Oh, you don't have money? Just think about that. You don't have enough money to exchange your currency? You don't get to come into the temple today. What? That's what they're doing. These are the ones that are keeping the people away. Jesus comes in, drives those people out. Now people can come in freely. And we view, we can see the hypocrisy in this type of thinking. Because people will say, well, I don't want to come to church because they're hypocrites. Well, okay, we'll drive out the hypocrites so you can come to church. Then what will they say? You do about the hypocrites. Huh? You do about the hypocrites. All right, which is? That's, unlo that's unloving. So which is it? What do you want? And Jesus already addressed that mentality with these people. Back in Matthew chapter 11, 16 through 17, and then in verse 20. 16 through 17, he says of the people, You came of John seeking one thing, or you saw with John one thing and you said, he's got a devil. Here comes Jesus eating and drinking. He's a glutton and a wine bibber. Which one are you actually wanting? And, all, and we discussed all that. All it is is deflection. It's a smoke screen. It's an excuse. It's nitpicking. And Jesus describes them properly. 
you're behaving like children. And then in verse 20, when Jesus goes in back into Capernaum, where most of his mighty works were done, let's not forget that the Bible tells us that Jesus upbraided the cities. And who remembers what that word upbraid means? I know we talked about it. It means to defame, to rail at, to rail against, to chide, to taunt, to cast in the teeth, to reproach, and to revile. All of these are tools at our disposal. And the reason why it's getting to this point is because of what's coming. Jesus is going to get into some parables and in those, par in those parables he's describing the destruction of Jerusalem and how that is closer than you think. So what does that mean? We've got to start getting down to business here. Now the blind, the lame come to him and they don't get treated like the money changers because they're different than the money changers. And even though the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and here's, you know, here really is the crucial part. And even though the Pharisees and Sadducees have done this to religion, they've manipulated it and corrupted it, it did not stop these people from still trying to come to the temple. We have a lot of people who would want to turn their back on Christianity, true Christianity, and turn their back on the Lord's church because, well, somebody inside of the church hurt them. I hate that for you. And that is terrible. It shouldn't be going on. But that's no reason for you to turn your back on God. What you need to try to do instead of just leaving the church is you need to try to fix that problem. You need to address that problem and that problem maker because if you just well I'm hurt therefore I'm going to leave all you've done is allow that bad behavior to continue they're gonna hurt somebody else and here are people hurting others inside of religion and Jesus came and cleaned house Christians are described as individual stones that build up the temple of God. If you're building a house, which granted today we have certain tools and mechanisms that can pretty much make anything fit where you want it to fit. But you put yourself back here and you're building a house and you're building it out of stone and you've got a stone that's not designed quite right. And then you try to cram that stone into place. What are you going to do to that house? It's unstable. You've got a stone in there that doesn't fit. You don't try to cram it into place. You get rid of it, you get a stone that's going to fit. And that's what we have going on inside of Christianity and that's the reason why there's so many problems. Is that we are trying to cram people into something that they don't fit. It's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole.
And if they are not going to be the kind of material that we're, that's needed to be so as to build a house, you don't try to force that. Because all you do is weaken the rest of the house. You set it to the side and you find the material that you need. So here's this scene. And we've got to take it all into its per proper perspective. We cannot just look at the meek beginning and then ignore what immediately follows the meekness. And it's an act of violence. It's an act of aggression. Aggression is not a bad thing. Violence is not a bad thing. And I would encourage you in John chapter 2, where the statement is, is made, how the apostles remembered that he had said, or that had been written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Do a study on that word zeal. And how it's being attached to Jesus in that event. And you're going to be surprised what you find. Here is Jesus, and he's bringing peace. And it's peace through strength. Here are these people that are being pushed to the side and that are not being allowed to come to God. And he paves the way for them by driving people out that do not need to be there. And of course, those in leadership don't like it. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. How in the world could you be displeased at something like this? Well, number one, they are upset because they are in leadership. They should have been the one to drive the money changers out. Hey, you guys stop doing this. You're not supposed to be doing that here. But they didn't. Here comes Jesus, and according to the Old Testament law, he has no authority inside of the temple. He's not a Levite. He's not a priest. And yet he comes doing the very thing that they were supposed to do. That creates displeasure from your leadership. But a good leader will be able to recognize, well, they're just simply doing something that I should have done in the first place. So there's a reason for displeasure. But the other side of it is the fact that, as is stated in John's record, they're losing their influence. Normally, the people would come to them. We're the ones in charge. We have all the answers. We are the ones that you need. And here comes this prophet of Galilee. And the people are singing his praises. It's the same situation as we said in how that Saul eyed David. An evil eye only beholding darkness. And even to the degree that children are actually taking part in this. Children seeing their parents involved in this process. And now the children are crying out, Hosanna, save us, son of David. He's gathering more people to him. And with this, we have Titus giving us a good description of how this operates, an evil eye only beholding darkness. Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure... All things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Because the elite refused these people, these people, and that because these people could not contribute to the giving of the temple. There's nothing we can gain from them. 
they set them to the side. But Jesus' popularity continues to grow and it's growing with the people that they have set to the side. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the chief priests, cannot stand it. And that because Jesus did not fit into their thinking. What's a king supposed to be like? Saul, David, Solomon. No. Your king is concerned with the spiritual things. Purity and virtue. Righteousness. Judgment. Justice. And upholding the things of God. And we'll close with verse 16. He said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And that because these children understand. They're not infested with worldly thoughts. Children have no slant. Children have no angle or prejudice to their thinking. I mean, just think about how gullible a child is. It's easy to fool a child into anything because of how much they trust a person that's in authority. And they see Jesus for who he really is. He's a provider. Not only is he a provider, but he's a protector. And you would think with the Pharisees and Sadducees, they see this stuff, they don't like it, and they come unto him and they hear what they're saying. Aren't you going to do something about this? Aren't you going to stop them from singing these praises about you? But what they're saying is correct. Why would I stop? What's the truth? You would just, it would, you would think with the scribes and Pharisees that they would learn eventually that their nitpicking is not going to work. That by them asking their questions and trying to trip him up and to catch him in his speech, it just builds his position stronger. But that's what people will do instead of recognizing what they're doing and change. They dig their deals in, or heels in harder. And that's not Jesus' fault. That's them. They could very easily change what they're doing and submit and follow. but then that would put them in the category, that would put them down here with these people. And they don't want to be down there with them. And he left them, went out of the city, into Bethany, and he lodged there. What makes Christ leave people alone? An attitude which is controlled by material things that will not accept spiritual truths that will nitpick, that will criticize, that will be negative at good things that are done. And he left them. So we'll stop there, verse 17. Sorry. Our time is up. Thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. Then we will dismiss.